Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Hammond. Um, I'm here to introduce our speakers and our topic uh, this afternoon. Um, this is my third AWS reInvent, and one thing that I think is really cool is we see the announcements at reInvent, and then is, uh, as early as one year later, we see them already deployed in the enterprise. So the pace of innovation is very fast, but the pace of adoption is also very fast in large enterprises. Um, that's a good example of what we're going to see today. Um, the solution we're going to cover involves processing and handling massive amounts of genomics and DNA data. It is built 100% on native AWS cloud technology, and, is, and it is almost entirely serverless. So a very innovative solution. The company that has built this is called Corteva. We have Ryan Smith from Corteva here today um, as one of our speakers. Uh, Ryan is a software development engineer uh, in their bioinformatics group. Um, and Corteva is a, um, the Agra spinoff of Dow DuPont, uh, which we're probably all familiar with. Corteva partnered with Sojeti to build this solution. Sojeti is the technology and engineering services division of the Capgemini group. Um, and we have Scott Warren, one of our national solution architects on AWS, as our uh, um, other speaker here today to cover the solution. So with that, guys, are you ready? Yeah. Thanks. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm Ryan Smith. Uh, I'm a software development leader at Corteva. Uh, I actually started at DuPont Pioneer in 2009, and I've spent my career uh, creating uh, software used for biological research um, to uh, move the fo world forward in, in terms of uh, science uh, space. Um, at Corteva, I've uh, had the opportunity to work on projects including uh, imaging, uh, geographic information systems, crop modeling, and most recently in bioinformatics. Um, I'll start off with a geography lesson. Does anyone know, anyone know what this is? North America, yes, good, okay. So let me, let me zoom in here a little bit. So we'll zoom in to the Midwest. And anyone know what this is? This, this is Iowa. Um, this is where Corteva is based out of. Um, and if you're no, you'll notice that there is a lot of green in this image. Um, and given the land usage in Iowa and given the, uh, the market position that we have, about 25% of all the green stuff that you see in this image comes from seed produced by Corteva. Um, we have a great responsibility to our customers to be able to produce that seed and uh, produce products that, they, um, that will grow well in these conditions. And I think you'll, you'll learn a lot about scale this week at reInvent, um, but this is, this is scale here, something that you can actually see from space, and this is what we're working on. Uh, in the bioinformatics space, we mainly work on uh, DNA data, and that comes from uh, sequencing technology uh, based on Illumina uh, sequencing machines uh, is mainly what we're using at Corteva. We have uh, entire rows of Illumina ma machines that are producing this data for us. Um, if you're not familiar with how Illumina sequencing works, um, what happens is the DNA is randomly fragmented into uh, these small fragments, and those fragments are uh, fixed to a, uh, uh, basically a glass plate. And the chemistry is such that they, they stand up on, on end, and then the chemistry can be changed so that they bend over and create this bridge. And in that bridge uh, state, a double-stranded uh, synthesis takes place, and two strands from that one strand can be produced. Um, once that strand, second strand is produced, the chemistry is changed again so that they, those two strands then are, go straight up on, um, are straight up. This happens uh, a number of times we repeat this process. So one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight. Um, and uh, the signal of each DNA strand is uh, significantly amplified. And you end up with a number of these uh, dense clusters of uh, repeated DNA fragments that are the same. And we use that amplified signal to be able to uh, image the, those DNA fragments and come up with what the sequence is. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is because the length of that fragment is very important. As you can imagine, if the fragment length is too small, um, it won't be long enough to bend over and create that amplification bridge. 
if it is too long, it won't be able to stand up straight and it'll just always be bowed over. So there's a narrow range of uh, length, about 50 to 150 base pairs, that it needs to be in order to make this work. And that impacts the data that comes out of this process. So this is um, what we get out of the process are about 150 base pair read lengths. And we need to align those reads to a reference assembly. The reference assembly can be billions of base pairs long. So imagine trying to align 150 character string to a string that is a couple of billion characters long. Um, a difficult problem, but one that has been solved. And there are efficient open source solutions for doing this and we employ those solutions to work. But of course, you have to pro provide your own iron to be able to do the processing that happens millions of times and do the storage of the results of that file. So um, we have such scale that uh, at Corteva, every six hours, we produce as much genetic data as existed in the entire public sphere in 2008. So an incredible amount of data that we're producing. And our on-prem system for handling that data um, was not going to keep up. We had a 35 node Hadoop cluster with two petabytes of storage, and those two petabytes were filled. And we had to come up with, had these hard conversations with our research partners where we said, no, you can't do this experiment right now. Um, we don't have the storage to store the data that's coming out of it. Um, and that wasn't a, a great situation to be in. And take on the, and include the fact that uh, DNA sequencing technology is, go is going to uh, continue to decrease in price. The demand uh, in the future was also going to increase. And we knew we just didn't want to continue to buy more and more nodes to add to that cluster just to be able to store the data. We knew that we needed to um, change directions. So we looked at different cloud solutions and um, decided on using AWS um, because they really understood our research needs. Um, we could talk to them about the problems we were having and they had um, dealt with sig uh, similar issues and they were able to point us to the right services for those things. They weren't shoehorning us into a particular solution just because that's what they had. Um, we also knew that uh, Amazon Elastic MapReduce was probably going to be needed, given that our on-prem system was, Hadoop, uh, was a Hadoop-based system. Um, so that was really a key uh, selling point for us, was being able to use EMR uh, to process this data. The other par part of that is S3, being able to store the data decoupled from the compute that goes with it. And being able to decouple those two things, the compute from the storage, gave us some cost efficiencies that allowed us to um, uh, order up the right amount of compute for what the data we needed to do, and also store it um, in, in, a, in, a, in a way that would work for us. So the way that we use the DNA data that we're producing, um, there are a number of uh, ways that we're using it for. So uh, the first one, genome-wide variation screening. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, familiar with 23andMe, um, but that's basically what we're doing here, where you send off your sample to 23andMe, and it comes up with um, some variations between your genetics that are in you versus the rest of the human population. And those variations might be things like you're susceptible to these diseases or um, you have these color of eyes, you have these certain traits about you. We're doing the same sorts of things for cereal crops. So um, is this particular corn seed going to be uh, drought resistant? Is this going to be disease resistant? What's the flowering time? Uh, what are these different aspects of this seed that we're looking at? That's the sort of, of analysis that we're looking at for, these, for this data. We're also doing transformational assays, so um, we're checking to see if the transformation event that we produced is what we expected. Did it uh, mess up any of the other genetics? Did it land in the right position? Um, was the entire cassette added properly? Make, make sure that that's working. For quality control, um, our lab is synthesizing DNA fragments, so we want to make sure that that synthesis process happened properly. 
And finally, uh, whole genome assembly. Um, there's actually a, a wide range of variation between corn seeds. It can actually be as wide of difference between a human and a chimpanzee. And just the normal variation screening isn't enough to understand those differences. You have to actually assemble the entire genome to be able to understand the, that full um, difference. But the remainder of the talk, we'll talk about just genome-wide variation screening and quality control and the applications that we built around those two problems. So the applications that we had um, already built were uh, SNP finder. That was for the whole genome alignment of short reads. That's for the whole uh, genome uh, variation screening. And what we're looking for are single nucleotide polymorphisms, single changes in the DNA um, for e as compared to a reference sequence. The input data size is quite large for each one of these samples, between 50 and 500 gigabytes. And when you are comparing a number of different samples, that uh, upper end can almost be unbounded amount of data. So the processing needs are, are quite, um, are quite strong there. On the vector quality control side, this is where we're synthesizing a DNA fragment for, using, for use in a transgenic event, and we need to make sure that that synthesis event happened uh, properly and make sure that the DNA sequence that we designed is what we got out. Um, that is important so that when we do the transformation event that it's going to work as we expected, and it's also important for regulatory purposes uh, for government agencies that uh, we can prove that that, uh, that synthesis was correct. The input data size is actually quite a bit smaller here, less than 10 megabytes for each sample, but there are um, tens of thousands of samples that are run each year, um, and we need to be able to, cr to um, meet that demand. So when we started off on this project, uh, we had to come up with a name. And the name that we came up with was Theseus. And I had the same reaction as maybe you guys are, what, what's Theseus, what's that mean? Well, it's actually uh, the name of a ancient thought experiment called the Ship of Theseus, where if you have a ship that's made out of wood planks, and over time those wood planks rot out and need to be replaced, um, you replace those boards, and over time, you might replace every single board on the ship. At the end, is it the same ship that you started with, or is it a different ship, given that it's a completely different board? Um, and we had to kind of ask ourselves these same questions with the applications that we're writing, where every single line of code is going to be replaced with something else. We, we thought Theseus was a good name for this project. So if you guys don't learn anything else from this, then you have a good name for your next project. And you can send your royalties to me or Scott. <laughs> Given that we uh, already had these applications in place, we had a pretty good idea of what the user interaction was going to look like for each application. For SNP Finder, um, there was a, tr a pipeline that transforms the data into a queryable state. And then users come in and create ad hoc queries to uh, understand that data and make sense of it. On the VQC side, the user interaction is a little bit different, where all of the data is processed up front uh, before entering the data, and the user interaction is basically to make sure that the um, data was processed properly and that the conclusions that the system made about the data uh, are correct. And finally, okay, we've made that conclusion, what do we do now with this, uh, with this vector? Do we throw it out or do we continue on with it? Given those uh, user interactions, um, early on in the project, we came up with some guiding principles of what we wanted the project to look like. We knew that we had time-sensitive workloads. We needed to be able to fill these demands for um, turnaround time and had very tight user expectations on um, how quickly the data needed to be processed. But we also knew we had a relatively small user base, maybe five users, and each of those users is a power user. And they might be executing something very complex and we need to be able to um, fill that need for that very 
uh, complex query that they're running. So <clears throat> being able to um, understand that you know, most of the time these applications aren't gonna be running because there's a small user base, but when they are running, they need to have great performance. We thought the serverless architecture um, really fit well with uh, that user pattern. So the basic idea that we had was that if there's, no, if there's no one using the system, there should be no servers running. That's really the, the guiding principle that we had. Uh, other guiding principles were immutable infrastructure, so we didn't want to have to um, treat our servers like pets. We wanted them to be livestock. We just wanted to spin them up and um, do the processing that they're required for, not have to worry about patching while it's running or making other things. We just wanted to spin them up, do the processing, and then turn them back off. And finally, we wanted to automate everything. There were a number of one-off manual processes in our legacy system, and we wanted to really avoid that because we didn't want to have to worry about that long-term maintenance um, that we had. We just wanted to make sure we could automate everything. And AWS gave us the tools to be able to uh, do that automation. Um, given these um, guiding principles and where everything stood, we came up with the, the fact that there's really a difference here between these two applications. And there should be a difference in design of how we architect these applications. We don't want to um, have everything use the same service just because we're doing it at the same time and maybe we understand that service really well. We should really tune the architecture of each application for the specific needs of that application. So at that point, um, we turned to uh, Sejeti because this was the, one of the first projects we've done in AWS and we really didn't have the expertise in-house to be able to build production applications. Um, so that's when we turned to um, Sejeti and, and with Scott's help we're able to uh, create them. All right, thank you Ryan. Um, so Ryan did a good job of kind of laying out um, what we had on premise, what our data was, what problem we held, had to solve. So now I'm gonna take the time to walk you through how we solved that in AWS, which services we used, how we plugged them together, things like that. Um, so the first uh, application that we have is SNP Finder. And so this is the one that has the large amounts of data that runs less frequently. And so um, the big thing here is the short reads that Ryan talked about, we need to align those, um, decide if what we found is actually a SNP or if it's a sequencing error, an error on the, the genetic sequencer. Um, and finally, we need to take that data and transform it into a queryable format, which in our case is a parquet file. Um, so walking through the architecture on how we completed this, um, so the first thing the user does is um, they need to know what data is out there and they need to submit a job to the system. So that is done through an API call. Um, so the, the user forms that API call and that's got things like um, where's my data, what data do I need to work with, um, how big a cluster, an EMR cluster, do I need to spin up for this? Um, what's the criticality of this? Different things like that. So the user submits the API call, that triggers a Lambda function, and we use the Zappa framework to build that out. Um, and from there, the, the Lambda function writes all the details about that job into an RDS instance. Um, and this was one of our first kind of design considerations we ran into where um, we looked at DynamoDB pretty heavily instead of RDS here, um, and after kind of a lot of tests and, and understanding what our data was and how it worked. Um, we were ended up doing a lot of full table scans and long table reads and everything. So DynamoDB was gonna be a very expensive option and not really gain any performance or anything like that. Um, so we decided on RDS at this point. So all that job information is written into our database. Um, and at the same time, um, that job ID is written to a queue. So we then had a CloudWatch event that runs every couple minutes. Um, it triggers the same Lambda function to, to check that queue. So is there a new job? Um, if no, the Lambda function ends and nothing happens. If yes, then that triggers the spin up of an EMR cluster. Um, and this cluster is actually defined by the user. So the user knows the criticality of that workload, um, and knows the rough idea on what the cost of this EMR cluster is gonna be. So they're gonna tell us what type of instances they need, um, how many of those instances um, to process their data in, in the critical time for them. Um, so as that data is processing and being transformed into that parquet queryable format for us, um, 
there's lots of intermediate files that need to be written and some intermediate files that needs to be referenced as uh, that data is processing. So our first stab at this, um, we wrote all those intermediate files to EFS and stored all of the, the intermediate files that needed to be referenced during the uh, data pipeline on EFS as well. And so we quickly found out that uh, we hit some um, EFS burst credit limitations um, and, our, and our performance dropped pretty drastically after we kind of hit that credit limit. So we revamped the process halfway through and started writing a lot of those intermediate files um, to an intermediate S3 bucket as we were going through. So then we ran into the issue of hot spotting on S3 and, and again kind of degraded our performance. So we kind of finally settled on a solution where um, as we write those intermediate files to S3, um, we stick a unique hash in front of the file name. Um, that distributes it evenly across the S3 nodes and, and avoids hotspotting for us. So our final architecture and solution has all of the intermediate files that are being written, um, sent to S3, um, and anything that needs to be read comes out of EFS still. So that was kind of the, the sweet spot for us as far as um, file movement during the processing job. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side there that uh, um, the data is pulled from an S3 bucket where the DNA sequencer drops the, the genetic data as it comes off the sequencer. Um, so once that processing is complete, um, the final parquet files, the, the result data, is written to a separate S3 bucket where it's kind of the permanent home for that data. Um, there's also an AWS glue process that we introduced later in our architecture um, to do some file cleanup and different things like that. And that's a good example of um, when we started this project, glue wasn't really ready for prime time, but as we kind of developed and built things, um, it, it came into its own and we were able to use it. So Ryan will talk a little more about later how we used um, AWS Glue for some file cleanup. Um, so when that processing is done, an SNS notification is sent out to notify the user that the, the job they submitted has been processed successfully um, and the result data is there for them to use. So um, the second portion of SNP Finder, we've got that data off the sequencer, processed, stored in our S3 bucket, ready to query. Um, we actually have to query it now and, and give the user the, abil the ability to do that. Um, so there are a couple ways we can query this data. The first two are position or purity and coverage. Um, those are a little more basic, kind of SQL type queries that we, we can access the files directly and do that. Um, but the more complicated queries are what we call neighborhood. Um, there, if you can see in the genetic sequence, we've got that red T. That's our SNP that we found. So we're very interested in finding what types of things are around that SNP. So things like other SNPs, um, percentage of Gs and Cs, any repetitive genetic sequences that are around there, um, annotations, things like that. And that's where we get into the really the, the big data type problem here, um, where being able to query everything that's around that, that one SNP that we found um, and why we needed an EMR to kind of query this data as well. So if we look at how the queries happen, um, we built a UI for the users. Um, it's built in AngularJS, hosted natively in S3. Um, so they go in and select the data they want to query, how they want to filter it, um, what outputs they want out of that data. Um, the UI then makes an API call back to API Gateway. From there, that triggers a Lambda function that works very similar to the way the data pipeline worked as well. Um, so a job ID is written to RDS, same kind of job parameters, um, also dropped on a queue, and then Lambda watches that queue the same way it did for the, the data ingestion pipeline. Um, there's one big difference here is um, we didn't want users to submit, submit too many queries um, or and kind of bump up our AWS build to an area we didn't really want to, to deal with. So we wanted to limit the number of queries that could be running at one time. And the way we found to do that is to actually limit the number of EMR nodes that our auto-scaling cluster would allow. So by saying you can only scale up to X many nodes on your EMR cluster, um, some queries won't run right away. Um, they're gonna need to sit in the queue and wait until the number of nodes in our cluster comes back down. Um, and so that was the way we were able to kind of regulate how many um, query jobs are running at a single time. So um, Lambda sees the new job out there, tells the EMR cluster to scale up. Um, from there, the EMR cluster goes out and pulls the data from S3, um, processes it in a similar way to query it, um, where it's referencing files on EFS, um, and then writing the results out to our S3 bucket, um, and then also some metadata about those results is uh, written to RDS as well. Um, and so from there, um, once the query is complete, um, the Lambda function returns it back to the user, and then it's available to download for the user or view in the UI for the user. So we take a look at the user interface for SNP Finder here. 
Um, this is the query page. So you can see on the left, those are all our different samples. So all the data that's been ingested through that ingestion data pipeline that I went through. Um, kind of in the middle and top right are all the different filters you can apply to the data. Um, those are those neighborhood filters that I was talking about. And then on the bottom right um, is all the options the user has for exporting that data. What format do they want it in? What file type? Um, what, what data they want in that output? Different things like that. <coughs> so that's SNP Finder. That's the, the big data that comes in infrequently. Um, and it's kind of ad hoc as when it needs to be queried and when somebody needs to look at it. Um, now I'm going to dig into the VQC architecture. And that's the one where, um, like Ryan said, much smaller data, normally less than 10 megabytes, but we have tens of thousands of these a year that need to happen. And so it's built quite a bit differently in AWS. Even though we've got the exact same source data still coming off the DNA sequencer, we had to solve this problem in, in a, a little bit different way. Um, so the first big difference in the VQC architecture is um, it's not a user-generated query. <laughs> Every bit of data that comes off a sequencer needs to go through this process. Um, so the data ingestion is triggered by um, our on-premise publisher subscriber system. So we've got a, a VPN connection to AWS, and each time new data comes off that sequencer, um, the pub subsystem sends a message that triggers a Lambda function for us. And that message says, this data came off the sequencer, it needs to be processed and put into VQC. Uh, so from there, that Lambda function um, spins up a, a batch instance. So we built this in batch instead of EMR. So we're working with much smaller data. Um, we didn't want to wait for the cluster spin up and scale time and things like that. Um, so we built this containerized in Docker and runs on batch. So um, the batch container spins up with that reference data, pulls it from the same S3 bucket the, off the sequencers, um, and processes the data for the, the vector quality control. Um, so after that processing is complete, um, it writes the results out to a different uh, S3 bucket, same as in the SNP finder. Um, there's some parsing, some post-processing parsing that happens in a Lambda function in this case. Um, and then an SES notification is triggered that goes out to, an email goes out to a distribution list saying, this data was sequenced, it's been run through the VQC system, and it's now available for use. Um, so now a user needs to access that data. It's in the system, they've received the email, how do they get to it? Um, so very similar to how we did SNP Finder here, where we've got a UI built out for this application, um, AngularJS hosted natively in S3. Um, the user goes in and selects what data they want to look at. And remember, they're not doing any processing this time. It's already all done. They just need to view the results. Um, so they select the data they want to look at. An internal API call is made to API Gateway. Um, and the Lambda function then pulls the proper data out of S3 and RDS for that metadata. Um, and displays it for the user to see. So this is what the UI for VQC looks like, um, where you can see up top that is um, the, the reference, the data they selected that they want to look at, and some different filters and ways they can, they can view that data. And on the bottom is the result of the processing that happened in AWS Batch as we brought that data in. So um, that visualization is actually using an open source tool called JBrowse. Um, which is a, a project that's built and supported to, to visualize this type of genetic data. Um, so it, it worked really well hosting that natively in Angular um, in an S3 bucket. Um, so at a high level, that's kind of how we solved the two problems. So the same data, but how do we work with them separately in different ways in AWS? We're on premise, we were constrained where this has to go into this Hadoop system. Um, so you can see two different use cases and, and how we solved it differently, one using EMR, the other using batch. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Ryan now um, to kind of go over a few of the conclusions we, we came to as we worked through this project um, and some of the benefits we've seen of having the system in AWS as opposed to on-premise. Thanks, Scott. <clears throat> so Scott went through a number of architectural diagrams, um, and they looked very different from each other, but really at the core, the concept is very similar, where you basically have a user interacting with a website. The website is hosted in S3 uh, through static bucket hosting. And that Angular website makes API calls uh, over the REST interface to an API gateway. Um, that forwards them on to a Lambda. The Lambda then uh, processes the business logic and gets its data from an RDS instance. Then the big difference between VQC and SNP Finder where uh, we're using batch and EMR, but in both cases we're processing data in S3 
that is put there by a DNA sequencing machine um, as a result of some lab process that we had. Um, it was really key to be able to make this difference between the two applications for us, where in VQC we had many small jobs and batch really made sense from an orchestration perspective, from a scheduling perspective. And EMR made a lot more sense for SNP Finder where we have a few big jobs and we really need the MapReduce system to be able to efficiently process that data. Um, making this, this architectural difference between the two applications um, was a really big, big win for us. Scott talked a little bit about glue and um, I'll just say again, it was um, introduced later on in the project. Um, it, we, we found out about it and looked at it for maybe using it as the usual um, pipeline process, um, but we needed some additional things that EMR offered, like being able to mount an EMR uh, mount, or uh, an EFS mount. Um, but we still really liked the idea of having a serverless EMR cluster. Um, so we thought maybe we could use this for data cleanup after a post-processing, uh, after the processing is done. Um, maybe the metadata changes or a sample needs to be moved around from one folder to another or um, two fields need to be merged together or something like that in the post-processing step. Um, and that is, was where AWS Glue was really uh, useful and it gave us the ability to do these things without having to spin up an entire cluster. Um, this is just a screenshot of a Zeppelin notepad we used for developing the PySpark code that would run on AWS Glue. Being able to run those queries interactively um, and come up with what the um, pattern needed to be and what the software needed to look like was, was very helpful for us as well. There are um, other technologies that have come up from AWS in the two years that we've been working on this. Um, that we would like to be able to use as well. Um, not just Glue, but also um, uh, Serverless Aurora is something high on our list to be able to move over to that so we don't have a long running RDS instance. Um, that's really high on our list, but there's other technologies that get introduced all the time that we're looking forward to using. So I, I remember uh, a couple months ago logging into the AWS console and seeing this picture of all these EC2 instances running and, th and I thought, oh boy, uh, the bill on this is gonna be bad if these don't automatically turn off once this is done. I better check in um, tomorrow morning to make sure that these all go, go away as we expect them to. Um, and they did, in fact. The next morning I came in and I looked at this and they had all uh, spun down as we had expected them to. Um, or we don't have to pay for that uh, compute time when we're not using it. We're only using the, the resources that, we're, that we need as we need it. Um, one other thing is that, you know, I, we, we mentioned that Corteva is the agricultural division of the merger between Dow and DuPont. Um, and as a Heritage DuPont employee, we kind of built our system around uh, the DuPont data systems that we had. And when we went through this merger, uh, we noticed that, well, Dow has a lot of SNP data as well that needs to be incorporated into the, these systems. And it was expected that we would be able to query this through the same application. Um, so, Normally, that might have been a very pain, painful process, but you know, being able to move this data around um, halfway ac across the country, um, maybe poking holes in firewalls, um, negotiating server time to be able to do the compute for this, it was actually really easy to be able to service this need, where we just ordered up a snowball, had it shipped to Dow's data center, they loaded up the data, um, and then shipped it back to AWS, it was imported into our S3 bucket. We created an ad hoc EMR cluster to do the transformation on that data and put it into our format, add the right metadata, and we had it in our application pretty, e pretty easily. Um, so it was really a, a really good win for us to be able to do that. Um, and we didn't have to deal with these resource contentions where you, know, you don't uh, merge with a multi-billion dollar company every day you don't really plan your data center around being able to do this processing. Um, so being able to spin that up on demand was, was really helpful. 
Finally, the, the business impacts have been great. Um, we don't have t the uh, resource contention that we used to have um, with our on-prem system. Um, there might be situations where different user groups are using the same, um, the same resource at the same time, and it might take an additional amount of time to do that processing based on what other jobs are going on. Um, in AWS, we don't have that because those resources are separated. We don't have to deal with that contention. Um, I also sleep better at night because I don't have to worry about our data being lost in um, a, a catastrophic event because all of it is stored in one physical location. With Amazon, it's stored in multiple locations and we don't have to worry about um, ne nearly as much uh, having a, a major catastrophe like that. And finally, being able to enable growth for our, our laboratory partners. Uh, being able to say, you know, you can do this experiment, you can run these samples, you can, you can do these things, and the data processing isn't going to be a factor. We'll be able to handle it. We'll be able to store that data once it's done is a really good feeling as well. So I appreciate you all um, taking the time to listen to us, and uh, thank you for coming, and we'll uh, have any questions that you have now. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so the bioinformatics tools, the open source tools, uh, assume a file system and need to interact with things on a, a regular file system. So we needed to be able to uh, mount that file system across the cluster for each one of the. Uh, each one of the uh, cluster nodes that it had. Um, that was really the driving part, part of that was the off-the-shelf bioinformatic tool. Yes, back here. No, uh, we have not uh, had to work with uh, other sequencing data. We've just strictly stuck with Illumina. Yeah, we had a pretty good understanding that Bowtie was the right aligner for us, um, given the legacy system that we had. So we just went with that. All right, other questions? Yes. Um, Asking about glue, um, compacting files, um, dealing with small files. Yes, I, we did run into that where um, <clears throat> there was issues and we needed to find the right balance between small and large size. Um, sorry, I can't give you any better details than that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so for the sequencing data, um, we do keep it hot in S3. We don't do any uh, glacier storage for that at this time. Um, I think that was kind of about the um, storage of data off sequencing machines was outside of this project. It was in a different project, actually. Um, but yeah, the decision was made in that project to keep it hot in S3 um, for the duration. I think there's some regulatory compliance too on how long we have to keep that raw data around um, and keep accessible for, for the compliance issues. Yes. Is there any particular reason why you want to read from EFS instead of put everything into every in the media file into S3 bucket? Um, <coughs> mainly, we're using EFS because the um, like the Bowtie aligner was requiring that it work with a file a file system object, so that's 
that was the main driver for that. Yeah, an open source tool we're using to process the data requires it to live on a file system. And it wasn't S3 compatible. Okay. That was the main issue. Yeah. Right. I think on this one we actually delete it after the processing is complete, right? Yeah, the, the intermediate the files that we're writing, yeah, yeah. we delete it right after right afterwards. I think there's like a cleanup process that runs. Like yeah. if the if the cluster dies for some reason and that cleanup process doesn't run, we have some some triggers that go in and, and clean up that file. Uh, so on, on the EFS thing, were you guys actually mounting the EFS volumes within the batch containers and then consuming the data in there? Uh, we mount it from the like we create a custom AMI for the outer um, for the outer EC2, mount it there, and then pass it down. I know we did look at trying to mount it within our Docker containers, and it ran into some roadblocks there. Yeah. 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 Uh, we store the metadata in our RDS database um, to be able to store it, to access it. Yeah. Um, sure. You want to talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so as the data processes using these open source kind of specific DNA tools that we were talking about, um, it writes lots and lots of intermediate files to S3 in this case as it's doing the processing. Um, and so just using kind of the native file names um, or, or file naming convention even as we were going through it, um, we noticed that it would start off performant and then very quickly throughout the process decrease. Um, so after some investigation, we did figure out that that was the S3 hotspotting. Um, so as we write the files to S3 now, I think we put a 16-digit random hash out in front of each file name. Um, and that helps to distribute it randomly across all the S3 nodes as we're writing those files and, and avoids the hotspotting issues. Yeah, basically the problem is the, the key on the object in S3, um, that determines what nodes in AWS that object lives on. And if you're writing a number of files with very similar prefixes, they all land on the same node. So when you try to access all of those, it hotspots that one node. So you prefix the key with something random and deterministic like a hash, and that distributes it across the many nodes in S3 so that you don't hit that issue. Uh, no, not in our case. It wasn't, yeah, we weren't able to do that. Yeah. Not that we're aware of. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Go ahead. Yes, that's right. That is that other project that I mentioned, <laughs> yeah, outside of the scope of this project. So there's a, another project that, that takes that raw sequence data and converts it to the FASTQ format. Um, so we receive the data in our pipelines in the S3 bucket in that format ready to process. There's, there's other genomic work that happens in, in Corteva. So we're not the only consumers of that data. So there's kind of a standard pipeline to convert the raw data. The, the last I heard from that project was that they were not streaming it directly from the sequencing machines. They were doing some um, intermediate work rather than hooking the, the sequencer directly up to S3. Yeah, because what we found was the latency of getting yep. the sequencer. Yeah, we ran into the same issue in that project. And, and yeah, there's, I know Illumina's looking at some native S3 tools to stream it out, but those aren't ready yet, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. 
Um, yeah. Yeah, so the question was how do we balance cost versus kind of user demand in SLAs? Um, so that's kind of something we try to put back on the, the business to make that decision. So we run enough of these and we've got a good idea of how many nodes and what they cost and then the time it'll take to run these things. Um, that if somebody wants to submit a big job or big series of jobs, we can give them an estimate on what that's gonna cost and they need to go back to their boss or their, their sponsor and, and justify that with them. So we're, as the IT department, we make this all available to them. Um, justifying the cost and how much they wanna spend on, on certain projects or certain data is, is on the business side to, to figure out. I, I, uh, yeah, have we had any problems with S3 metadata? And as I said before, not yet, not that we're aware of. <laughs> okay, any other questions? All right, well, thanks for everyone's time today, and uh, we'll hang out if there's any, any other questions after that. Yeah, thanks.